All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, wow. Let's, uh, if you have, if you have your Bible, let's open up. Ah, I have so much in my heart for over these days. Um, let's open up to Song of Songs, chapter two, verse 10. As you do that, um, it's such a joy to be with you guys, to be here. Uh, my wife and my five children send their, who said wow, hold on. <laughs> we are trying to obey these scriptures <laughs> in every conversation of our life. <laughs> That's like, um, I have five kids, uh, two girls, three boys. They range from 12 10, 7, 3, and 1. I said, Lord, you really do have a sense of humor because I didn't know that 40 and a newborn was going to be the plan. I laughed too. Oh, yeah. I was like, okay, Lord. This is awesome. Team no sleep again at 40. Uh, my wife is several years younger than me. She's 35. Well, she would kill me. She's 34. She'll be 35 in August. Um, right? Those of you who are married, you understand. She is not 35 yet. <laughs> uh, I will be 41 in September. Um, but so my wife and my children send their greetings. Uh, Stephen, who was here leading in a moment of communion, uh, his wife, and they have six children. Uh, together, we are an expensive Chick-fil-A bill. <laughs> Take up a whole row at the movie theater. Uh, it's amazing. Um, but really honored to be with you guys. We had the privilege to sit with your leaders last night for a few hours and have dinner together. And I've just realized over time I'm coming up in October on 20 years of being born again. Uh, prior to that, uh, drug addicted, drug dealing, bound in sin, suicide, depression, darkness, um, in and out of jail 15 times. I'm not resume reading because we don't glory in Egypt, right? Like I'm, I'm grateful that the Passover lamb has set me free. Um, what was is what was. And in a moment of sin, saturation, and satisfaction, I didn't know any different uh, it's why the power of the blood establishes a new creation and not just a people that are worldly, but now they're trying to be religious. Um, and so I didn't know any different. Uh, but coming up on 20 years, uh, I've just learned. You know, we've had the privilege to travel all over the world doing crusades and conferences and Israel tours and unique relationships with orphanages and prisons and just all types of things literally all over the world. Uh, relationships with leaders and churches and so on and so forth. Um, and again, it's, it's all by God's grace, because I don't, I don't deserve to be able to do those things, much like Paul would say, even though I'm not making that comparison, he recognized that he was the chief of sinners. All right? There was something about himself, hostile, rebellious to God, even to the point of uh, assassinating, right? publicly executing those who were along the way. Um, but over the time, I've just learned that if you just let somebody talk long enough, you easily find out what's in their heart. Right? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we had the honor to have dinner last night, and just sitting there, I just felt refreshed as we left uh, our time at the table, sitting with uh, your leaders. Because, man, like, th their heart really burns for Jesus. And really, like, there's, a, there's an ache in their hearts. You can just sense it for God, for his purposes, and for his people um, on a global scale and for what it is that they've given their life to see established here in this city and region. 
And it's just refreshing because there's no reason behind the scenes to try to put on some sort of act, right? To try to flaunt some facade, right? And in reality, you can't keep it together well enough, long enough in order to fake it hard enough when it's not real. And that's why I say if you just are around somebody long enough, Eventually, you crack the code, you get beyond the, the filter, and you begin to see or to peer into, like, oh, this is really what it's all about. Um, but so we're really honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. for man, we, we really honor you guys. Uh, thank you for inviting us to come and be here. Uh, I don't take it for granted. And I really feel as if the Lord has something extraordinary for us together over these days. Um, as you turn to Song of Songs chapter 2, Verse 10, uh, the, the writer is writing something that has provoked me my entire born-again life. And I'm going to share some things intimate from my journey and try to put that into a frame of what it is that I feel like the Lord is after this morning or there's a unique emphasis for us together, something that the Lord wants to brand us in a fresh way, um, even to take us beyond the things that we feel we already know. Right? Because when we bring up certain subjects or when we bring up certain aspects of the Lord, one of the most dangerous places that we can fall into is to say, oh, well, I've already seen him that way. I already know him that way. I've already discovered that. That's something that I feel is already mine. As if to assume that you could corner the market on a revelation of Jesus and that you could have explored everything that there is to know about him in a particular aspect of what he chooses to reveal of himself. Right? So we don't want to be that. One of, one of the quotes that I like from all time is, the man who will never learn is the man who feels he already knows. Right? And so we want the Spirit to take us beyond the things that we feel we already know like the layers of an onion, things that we feel like we can already see. We want it to get peeled back in greater measure. We want to dive deeper, head first, baptized into the deep end of wild, radical devotion to Jesus in aspects of him where we may feel like we've already perceived things by the Spirit in revelation that there is to him. So Lord, we want to see you afresh. Lord, we want our hearts to burn in a glorious way. As it was, as John was on the Isle of Patmos, he said, I turn to see the voice of him who spoke to me. And when I turned, there he was. And though I felt I already knew him, I saw him as I had never seen him. Lord, we want fresh revelation this morning in your comings. Would you reveal yourself to us in a glorious way? Holy Spirit, we pray, do what you do best. Do what you are jealous to do. Would you unveil the beauty and the majesty and the glory and the worth of this man, Jesus? This crucified God, this bridegroom king, the lamb that was slain, root of Jesse, descendant of David, eternally worthy son of God. Holy Spirit, help our hearts to see him in a way unlike we have ever seen him and then give grace so that we can respond to him the only way that is appropriate when we actually see him and see him rightly. We want to give you everything again, Jesus. Here we are. Here we are. Touch our hearts. Brand us with fresh fire this morning. And give grace for us to once again, as we may feel like we have already done so many times over the course of this journey. We want to give you everything that we have. You are ours, and we want to be wholly yours. Um, so we pray this morning, King Jesus, you can have me. <laughs> and whatever you want from me, I want you to have it. So ask what you will, do as you desire. Um, my life is not my own, and to you I belong. And as the song sings, I give myself, I give myself away.
The writer of Song of Songs, in chapter 2, verse 10, writes these words. Um, and depending on your translation, it may read a little differently, and so I might combine several translations to further emphasize the point of what I feel like the writer is after. But just very simply, the writer in chapter 2, verse 10, says, Arise, my beloved, my beautiful one, and come away with me. And I pray that these words, as simple as they may be, would be incredibly provoking and would actually bring a disruption to life as we have known it up until this point, and that it would begin to redefine the offering of our devotion that we have experienced a current level of satisfaction with. And that the Lord this morning, we would give him the power and reserve him the right to redefine or to bring a new definition to our devotion. Where whatever it is that he would say, this wedding of Cana, Mary wisdom that she offers the disciples in John chapter 2 verse 5, when she recognizes uniquely that Jesus is going to do something, and she turns to the disciples, and in John 2, 5, she says, whatever he tells you to do, do that. So we're not talking about some weird religiosity. We're not talking about systems that are built with a lack of sensitivity, right, where we just want to create an independence, where we form our little devotional darts and we throw them at Jesus and we demand that he receive whatever it is that we want to offer him. No, 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 that's not exactly what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about where we've been touched by God in such an extraordinary way, where the unraveling of our affections and every other lesser lover that our attention has been prone to wander to. Where every other thing, place, person, conversation that pertains to our life gets evaluated and sifted by the power and the grace of God released into our lives by the jealous work of his spirit. And where the spirit begins to touch us deeply, where the spirit begins to whisper to us softly, and where there's this unavoidable provoking that begins to happen, where my attention and my affection and my allegiances begin to get shaken because I am recognizing in a particular season that there's something God wants to do and I don't have the ability to form it myself, but it requires a response to what it is that God is revealing. And he begins to release unique invitations which is why I even loved something that we were praying pre-service or something that we were praying in the room where hungry hearts were just exploding with a desire for God to do something. And the prayer went something like this, Lord, make people keenly aware of things that God has revealed or that they've been invited into in specific seasons and maybe in different moments where we've chosen not to pivot with God and to go the way that he was leading whenever there's a revealing of a different trajectory. Because we do have a choice of all the things that God is able to do. The one thing that God cannot and will not do is say yes for you. He's a gentleman. And even at times where he may know what's best for you, he won't simply take it from you. He won't override your system and robotically make you mechanically do whatever he knows is best for you. He's so loving, he's so kind, he's so long-suffering, he's patient, he endures, he perseveres. When I consider all the seasons of my hostility and my resistance to God, I'm not talking about seasons where I wasn't born again. That's expected. We expect those who don't know the Lord to resist him and at times reject him in different ways. But I'm talking about born again. I'm talking about tasted of the powers of the age to come, like Hebrews says. I'm talking about having seen the lamb, having given my life to him by his grace, and now in different moments where I know that he's speaking, where I know that he's revealing, when I know that he's leading me in certain ways, not wanting what it is that I know he wants. 
And anybody who tries to put on a front and tell me that you've never been in that place, you're lying. I just don't care. Like, you're not going to convince me of otherwise. Anybody who just tells me, oh, well, I've always wanted what God wants. Maybe we're not listening to the same voice all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe we're not actually hearing the same guy. Right? Because there's been times where he's offended my intellect to bring me into intimacy. And things that he was saying just did not make sense to me. Things that he was saying seemed to be opposite of the directions that I was leaning, the things that I was going for, what it is that I was believing God and praying and fasting and contending. Has there ever been a moment where Jesus has revealed himself to you in such an intimate way, but you were challenged or confronted by how you actually came to know him as he continued to reveal himself? It would sound something like this in Matthew 16 when Peter says, For thou art the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. And Jesus is like, I applaud that. Praise God. You're not just parroting somebody else, right? Like you have now individually, intimately seen something that my Father has revealed to you of who I am. The Spirit has unveiled me to you in a personal way. Praise God. And since you feel like you can see me now, let me continue to reveal to you who it is I am and what it is that I'm about. I'm about to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to lay my life down, and I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be brutally executed in public. I'm going to do it joyfully. I'm going to be mocked by people in powers, but on the third day, I'm going to be raised. And Peter's like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, sir. No. Like, and pulls him aside and rebukes the mess out of Jesus. Surely that's not who you are, and these things are never going to happen to you. Why? Because in another place, he says, we've left everything to follow you. And at times, the way that Jesus was revealing himself and what he was actually about was confrontational to the dreams that they had formed for themselves. It was difficult to reconcile their ambitions with the way that Jesus was revealing himself. And Peter's like, those things can't happen to you because if that's actually who you are, that doesn't fit well into the story that I'm writing for myself. Like, that's going to create unique challenges for me, and it's going to disrupt some things that I felt like we had going on. Like, we've been building a good thing up until now. And if that's what you're actually going to do, I don't know how I would still do everything I thought I wanted to do if that's what you go and do. So if that's who you are, who am I then going to be? But oh, what an amazing place to continue to lose the idea of ourselves in the revelation of Jesus. What a wild invitation. Jesus said, those of you who spend your whole life protecting and preserving, you will ultimately be the ones that end up losing out. But to any of you who are willing to lose your life, yes, some of you beautifully as martyrs, I get that, but not all of us. Right? Sometimes it's harder to live for him than it would be to die for him in a moment. <laughs> Sometimes it'd be much easier to say, Lord, just take my life. I'll give you a yes in one moment, and if they execute me for you, then praise God, I get to be with you forever. Right? Sometimes that would be much easier than getting up and choosing a thousand times a day to actually live in a way that's going to honor him and his value system and to consistently remain under the harness of God by the beauty and the power and the tension and the grace of God's spirit to be a Jesus people in the earth. Sometimes that is much more difficult than to give him one yes and to be with him forever than to have to endure days, so to speak, of saying yes over and over and over. But what a joy, what a delight, what an honor to continue to lose our life for his sake and and for his gospel. And the Lord is issuing an invitation in these days, I believe, to a company of people that will be like 2 Peter 3.12 says. We are those who hasten the day 
of the coming of God. And in this hour, I believe as we're leaning into these last days, the reality of Revelation 22, 17, there's a unified desire. There's a unified cry that is raging, so to speak, jealously from the Spirit, but is beginning to burn and to erupt from the hearts of the saints. And Revelation 22, 17 says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And this anthem, this cry, this eruption, this declaration, come, Lord Jesus, come, is actually altering our lives. This cry, this anthem, is actually governing over all of our delights and actually governing over all of our directives. And the Lord is establishing for himself a people in these last days that are going to fulfill, yes, this John 17 unity. And they're going to fulfill, yes, this Ephesians 4 maturity. And they're going to fulfill, yes, Paul's charge in 2 Corinthians 5. This family of new creatures, this wildly possessed people, scattered throughout the nations of the earth, now repopulating cities and regions and nations to be established as heavenly colonies, where Paul says, old things have passed, all things become new. We now bear on our lives by the Spirit, the ministry of reconciliation in perfect alignment with God's charge in 2 Peter 3, that he's not distant, he's not disconnected, he's not disinterested, but beloved, he's patient. For a day is like a thousand years, says the Lord. And God has a desire that all men would come unto repentance before the release of the return of his son. And this Psalm 2, raging of the nations, is going to present the context for the beautifying of the bride to rise in unity and maturity, where there's a greater glory reserved to those of us in the last days that are recognizing this anthem cry in our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of fame. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of celebrities. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of politics. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of power. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of financial manipulation. Come, Lord Jesus. And I'm not just talking about in a worldly sense, but I'm talking about how these things have gained access to the hearts of people that are leading movements and streams and supposedly the charge of the Christian landscape. But God is going to be faithful to give his son everything that he promised him. Because there is one man that can eternally live with entitlement and it be right. Jesus is entitled to have everything that his father promised him. You see, at times we live with entitlement, but it's expectation that's gotten corrupted. Right? Where we feel like God owes me something because of the way that I've fasted, because of the way I've prayed, because of the time that I've put in, because of the money that I've given, because of the missions trips I've gone on, because of how I've served, I've labored amongst God's people, I've been after the things of his house. Let me just encourage you. God owes you nothing. No thing. Like Romans 8 says, if he has not already given us his son, then why would he not delight to give us all things? But God is going to be faithful to prepare this comparable companion, this suitable helper, that even in the life of Adam in Genesis 2, as he was evaluating the life of the man, he says, it's not good for the man to be alone. Hear it this way. It's not good for the son of man to be alone. For I will fashion for you a suitable companion, a suitable helper, a comparable companion. It's an immediate evaluation that reveals eternal implications. For it's not good for the man to be alone. The father's desire, looking over the life of the man, says, I don't want you to be alone. I'm going to prepare a bride for you. I'm going to ready her by my own process. And we know that the father puts Adam into a deep sleep. (laughs) We know that the father pierces Adam's side. We know that the father pulls a rib or a part of Adam out and forms and fashions this bride 
that by his own jealous desire, he has determined Adam deserves. And then he wakes Adam up from a deep sleep and brings him to his presentation day where he says, this is the bride that I have formed for you. This is the bride that I have made ready for you. This is the companion to rule alongside of you. This is the suitable helper, the one that is comparable to you, that I have brought you into covenant in order for you to experience and to extend my intimate rule throughout all of creation. This is what I've wanted to do for you. And Adam, you deserve this because I have said so. Well, I would submit to you that Jesus was laid down that Jesus' side was pierced and opened, that blood and water flowed out from his side. It wasn't just a rib like it was Adam, because what's of flesh can only continue to perpetuate flesh, but what's of spirit continues with things of spirit. And blood and water poured out. And right now the Father is readying a bride that the Son deserves. And Jesus was raised from the deepest of sleeps, so to speak. And he was awakened and resurrected and now ascended to the right hand of glory and majesty and power where he is awaiting his presentation day. Adam got his and Jesus is still waiting for his. And Revelation 19, 7 says that all of our lives are leaning in towards this glorious moment, this marriage supper of the Lamb occasion, where the possession will happen the way that the Son deserves. And so we need to see our lives in the context of this people that are hastening the day of God's coming. See our lives in the setting of this beautiful bride that the Father has determined the Son deserves. And the work of His Spirit now throughout the nations and yes, individually, uniquely in your heart is at work right now in order to more prepare you to spend forever with the bridegroom. And as Mike Bickle would say, one of the greatest intentions of this age is to cultivate a love and a deeper place of loving intimacy with Jesus. Because it's one of the only things that will exist forever. And so we have to identify the variety of ways that God is designing our lives in order to make more real the love that we have for his son. Because this is what life is about. And he is working all things together for good. I know that in our American culture at times, in a devotional way, we include an additional word that's not actually there. For God is working all things together for my good. As Richard Wormbrandt exhorted, while he was still alive speaking at a church in America, he said, why is it that in the American or in the English language, the only letter that demands to be capitalized when it stands alone is the I? <laughs> he said, what is it about us that always wants to exalt the desires of the I? Paul would say in Galatians 2, it's no longer I that live. I now belong to another. My life is now reserved for the enjoyment and for the desires of another. This is what consecration is all about. right? I believe that consecration and holiness is just the byproduct of more real satisfaction in Jesus where you can't actually sustain it in your own power, in your own desire to apply all the right filters to your life out of religiosity, but where the Spirit has actually touched your heart so deeply, 
where God himself has revealed his son to you so intimately, so powerfully, and what it has done to actually set free my affections from all of the other things at times, which is why the charge of Hebrews in chapter 10 is to get untangled from all of these other things and to run with perseverance, chapter 12, to run with perseverance, the unentangling of all of my affections to other lovers, to other things that occupy places or places in my attention that aren't necessarily inherently wrong, but they're wrong because they're not right for me. And this is the graduation of entry level right and wrong according to law and systems. Where I'm not just trying to figure out what I can get away with and people aren't going to look at me sideways. Right? But where the Spirit has actually bridled me. And I don't have the desire to just be the wild horse anymore who's just doing all of its own thing and who's just bucking all the time and trying to get my own way and have enough of Jesus to barely make it. No, no, no. But the Spirit has bridled me. And in the bridling of the Spirit, now I've become yielded. And through the yielding of my strength and my desires, whatever he wants, I want. And this Psalm 45, 7 company, where it says, who love what he loves and hate what he hates, to them, they will be smeared with oil and gladness. In other words, they are a joy-filled, oily company. And I don't know about you, but I want to be joy-filled and have oil in my day. And the way that that actually gets established the way that God desires, because I'm not talking about just simply system of the age stuff that at times makes us happy or gets our interests. But I'm talking about a freedom to love Jesus the way that he deserves to be loved. And by his grace, in our desires and in our affections, a deep rooting in a love for the things that he loves. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That word embodied incarnation came and tabernacled or put flesh on and walked amongst men. You cannot love Jesus the way that he deserves to be loved without loving this word. You want to love Jesus? You have to love this word. And we don't get to massage it to endorse our own unique life interests. We don't get to manipulate it to authorize the things that we think we want to be about. We're not going to bend it for cultural satisfaction. We're going to lay down the plumb line of who we know God is, and we're going to love what he loves, even at times when the nations are raging, when there's hostility and demonic agenda. We're going to love what he loves, and we're going to be more committed to what What's already been revealed here in this Bible, and we're gonna love all of it. And not just the parts that we think we agree with. Because it doesn't start with you, it starts with Him. We love what He loves. There's too much of this. Well, everything I love, God has to love. No, 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 absolutely not. Some of the things that you love, He's actually trying to deliver you from so that you can love what he loves. Because some of your loves are interfering with the things that he loves. And he's not a God in our image, but we're becoming a people conformed to the image of his son. And these people who are going to hasten the day of the Lord are going to be a people that are giving over to praying and fasting. And they're going to pray and fast in order to radically align themselves with God and to radically align themselves with God's agenda in their hour of history. Jesus in Matthew 9, when he was questioned, more like accused, about fasting, it says that the disciples of John came to Jesus and they accused him. They're creating an indictment. They're leveraging their own self-appraisal of righteousness against the man Jesus. And they say in Matthew 9, we and the Pharisees fast often. But we've been watching you, bro. 
And you and your guys? Y'all just ain't cutting it, man. <laughs> like we've been watching. And we fast often, and we've been watching, and you guys don't. And we demand an explanation. And in Matthew 9, 15, Jesus reveals to them that there's coming a day when the bridegroom will be taken up from them. And in those days, they that love me, my disciples, they will be found fasting. There's something about the absence of Jesus that should be fueling our efforts in fasting and praying. Because it doesn't matter how right things may seem to be, they are not as right as God desires them to be. And because he is not here in the midst of us uniquely the way that he desires to be, we give ourselves to fasting not out of some religious hurdle or hoop, not out of performance. That's the thing about the Pharisees. The Pharisees fasted two days a week, but they did it out of performance and not out of pursuit. John Wesley, the great of old, who shook a region with the glory and the power and the fire of God. He said, I set myself on fire and men and women come to watch me burn. In his founding days of the Methodist movement, he would roll over in his grave, as they say. In his founding days, he would not ordain someone to the ministry unless they were committed to fast two days a week. <laughs> Some of us are offended right now <laughs> because of the idea of fasting. But fasting is not a suggestion in the life of the believer. Amen. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, when you fast, fast this way. So it's not up for debate, it's a when. It's not up for someone having to convince you in an argument that it's not just exclusive to the fivefold, that it's not just for those who want to be in leadership, that it's not just for pastors, preachers, laborers around the world, that it's not just for intercessors, right? And intercession, let, let me just say this, not a rabbit trail, intercession is not just for the women of the church. <laughs> Right, like intercession isn't just the ministry of the women who don't have anything else to do. Right, like there's an intercessor in the heavens and it's not a woman. <laughs> the one who ever liveth to make intercession, the one interceding for the Father's purposes and the work of the Spirit and for your life right now is in the heavens and he is interceding. It is a ministry eternally of the man Jesus. Right? And so Jesus says, when you fast, fast this way, implying that all of us that love him are going to obey him this way because he says in John 14, they that love me are going to be those that obey me. So if we have an obedience issue, we don't have a works issue, we have a love issue. We don't need to work harder, we need to let God love us in a greater way to free us from whatever is resisting in our hearts, our life being given to what it is that we know he wants. Obedience is an issue of love because you can get people to do what you want them to do out of conformity, but you'll never get their heart. You can motivate them with a fear of punishment. You can incentivize them with all types of other interests, but you'll never get their heart. You'll never get it all. But if you get someone's heart, you get everything. And at times, it requires unique times in fasting and prayer in order for us to be able to discern God's agenda. Even as it was for Esther in chapter 4, a woman who God raised up, and in her moment of history, when the stage of history was set, Mordecai comes with an intervention. Snap out of it, Esther. Wake up, or you're going to miss the moment that God has created for you. Don't think that everything that God has done 
to bring you to the place that he has you was only to satisfy your own self-interest. Don't think that your process was only so that you could leverage your platform in the unique ways that you've determined are best. Esther, it's not because you're so cute. Esther, it's not because you just had more money than others. Esther, it's not because you were smart enough, because you just hid well enough. Like, no, Esther, you have to be able to acknowledge that God has divinely been designing a story in and for your life, and that this this is a moment where if you don't snap out of it, this intervention is necessary because the heart at times is so prone to wander for after other things and lovers and conversations. And Esther, I need you to actually wake up so that you can see what it is that God is trying to do. Because Esther, if you won't do it, if you won't give God the yes that he is looking for, what does he say? God will raise up deliverance from another place. Which means to me that we are indispensable to God. We are irreplaceable. We are irreplaceable to God. You are loved by God in a way that he loves no one else. He receives affection from you in a way that he receives it from no one else. You are irreplaceable to God. But at times, we are replaceable in the will of God. <laughs> Esther, if you don't say yes to him in this moment... He's going to find someone else that is going to say yes. Because you don't reserve the right to determine if what God wants to do is actually going to get done or not. Because that would make you God and it would make him subject to you. But you are not God. And it is not your will that he has stretched out over the timeline of history. Your agenda, your eternal purpose is not what's at work right now in this moment of history. He is working all things together for good, but it's because he has already determined what it is that he knows is good. And to those of us that love him, to those of us that are called according to his name, to those of us that are aligned with his purpose, he is using our up and our downs, our celebrations and our sorrows, our trials and our triumphs in order to develop something in us that is consistent with what it is that he already wants. And he looks at Esther and Mordecai says, you have to understand what it is that God wants to do. And what does Esther say? She says, Mordecai, you and your team go and fast for me. For three days, don't eat or drink, and me and my maids or my servants, me and my team, are going to do the same thing. And after we rise from the fast or from praying and fasting, I will go in to speak to the king. And if I perish, I perish, but so be it. I like to say it this way. Sometimes we have to be on one so that we can recognize how we're supposed to live when we're off of one. <laughs> Sometimes we have to fast and pray so that God can actually deliver us from all of our desires that are creating complications with his agenda. Esther says, I actually am going to have to go and fast. Because the consideration of these consequences are too much for me. You see, Esther could have very easily or very easily used her platform for power. Used her platform for politics. Used her platform for prestige. Used her platform for her own purposes and her own drive and leveraged it according to all of the desires that she had. But she recognized that there was something about getting into the place of fasting and praying that was going to provide to her the grace and the power to stand up into and under whatever cost was going to be associated with what she knew God wanted in her moment and in her life. 
and those of us that are going to hasten the day, it is going to be very difficult to discern when so many things are running wild in our culture. When so many voices and so many people are claiming to be speaking for God and this is who Jesus is and they're endorsing all of their movements and all of their methods and all of their platforms and all of their desires with supposedly a Jesus, a Jesus that just authorizes every way they want to live and whatever it is that they want to do and however it is that they want to set their life up. Supposedly, this Jesus that becomes more like us over time is the one that is stamping his approval on their life. It's going to be difficult to discern who Jesus actually is in a crowd of many that are claiming to be spokesmen or advocates of him and his purposes if we are not consistently giving ourselves over to the sifting of our attention, our affections, and our allegiances through the place of fasting and praying. Because if fasting does anything, it does exactly that. It evaluates my attention. It gives a thorough investigation to what touches my affections and what moves me. It reveals where my anchors have been put down and where my allegiances have been formed. Jesus said, in the day when the bridegroom is taken from them, then they will fast. Fasting helps to cultivate an addiction to the presence of Jesus. Fasting helps to cultivate the harboring, if you would, of this Maranatha cry on the inside of lovers that he turns into laborers. Fasting helps to reveal the other areas, spaces, and conversations where my life is being satisfied by things other than the person of Jesus. And it's why he will at times invite us away from other things that are occupying space in our attention or our affections and things in different moments and seasons can become wrong to you in a way that is unique to you even if they aren't necessarily black and white wrong for everyone else. But James 4 says, if any man knows what he should do and that man does not do that, then to him it is sin. And how many of us really want to give Jesus what it is that he's asking for? Well, that may be easy so long as we think that we're the ones that get to form the conversation. But when the Lord begins to reveal his desires and he begins to touch things, stuff, places in the conversation of our lives, at times there is a resistance in our hearts when we are experiencing a certain measure of satisfaction or a certain layer of identification through the thing that Jesus is now touching. Man, I've had God ask me for all types of crazy stuff. But what changed the game for me is when I stopped seeing it according to some religious scope and I understood it in the context of an intimate relationship. And I stopped thinking to myself, why is he trying to take things from me? Because at times we become so consumed with the cost, with what we think we're losing, with what we think we're giving up. Right? Like, oh my God, like... Man, like, here we go again. Like, the Lord is asking me, and, I've, and I just have to give this up and give that up. And man, like, the Lord's taking all these things from me. No, 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 no. Why is it that we always associate in a greater way with the pain and not with the prize? The prize will always eclipse the pain. <laughs> and when I understood it this way, it actually radically changed my life. It's not a have to do. And I know we hear it all the time. It's a get to do. But I heard the Lord say to me one time years, years, years ago, will you love me this way? I'm looking for you to love me this way. And as an offering of love, 
Would you turn over your attention to me in these areas? As an offering of love, would you turn over your affections to me in this way? And somehow I no longer saw it according to things that I was losing. Because you might think to yourself, well, what am I going to do if I offload all of these other things and I end up with so much empty space, so to speak? Well, it's only empty until the Lord fills it. And he doesn't just fill it by replacing stuff with more stuff. He fills it with himself. Where we get an experience of God that at times there's no other way that we would have been able to come into. And I remember talking to a brother of mine. I mean, I love this guy. And this was years ago. And when I saw him come walking through the airport, I was so deeply challenged by visually how I knew he was carrying surrender on his life because of how the Lord had reduced him and like dwindled him down. I could tell that he had been fasting and, and not just softly, but he was like going for it because someone who was normally like a bigger stature type of guy was very, very weak and broken and feeble and small. And I asked him like, bro, like what have you been doing? And I remember he told me the way that God had led him over the course of a year to fast. And it was something just completely wild. Like seven days on, seven days off, like multiple 40s over the course of a year. And I remember on the inside, I started binding devils and like rebuking like the enemy's desires. And I was like, bro, like there's no way. Like, bro, that is just, that is crazy. Like that's not God, man. Like there's no chance. I was offended by how God had invited someone else into a place of devotion that was so confrontational to me that I could not even receive the idea that God would actually speak to someone that way. And rather than be challenged by it, I was so confronted that I immediately wanted to excuse it or let's jump into spiritual warfare and bind this thing. And I remember getting back to my hotel room and I was sitting in the room later that evening just trying to spend time with Jesus and just in a moment of vulnerability I said, "Lord, like like is that is that you?" And he was like, "Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's me." And I was like, "Oh my Lord, like I've never heard you say something like that." Like like I didn't think it was you because it was so crazy to me. Like I didn't think you would actually say something like that to somebody. And he said, "Mike, that's because you won't let me speak to you that way." And it didn't you see because we we have to be real quick here. Not because of time, that's not what I'm saying, but because we have a decision to make right now. It didn't immediately weigh me down with this guilt and this shame at the example of how the Lord was using the life of a brother in order to confront me and to bring discipleship to me right like we get the Genesis 4 thing like Cain and Abel at times when you don't want to be confronted by a brother's life it's easier to assassinate him and to excuse yourself from the embodiment of God's desires in another person when God's mercy to Cain was the example of his brother all right Cain's crying out for more and God's like no 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 I'm going to give you more but I'm going to package it in some one that offends you <laughs> right and Cain's like oh lord I want to know how to please you or worse I just want to keep doing my own thing and not feel bad about it which is said Cain was bringing an offering and Abel was doing what the Lord was already pleased with but Cain wanted to continue to do what he wanted to do rather than being bothered by the example of his brother's life it was easier to assassinate him so that he was no longer confronted by him and so in the moment when I felt deeply confronted by my brother's life it didn't add all this guilt and this shame to me in fact it did the exact opposite I felt like it brought me into a place of freedom and created a space in my heart 
in a way where uniquely God could now create a conversation with me that beforehand I was not even open to and I believed in my heart that he wouldn't even be willing to actually talk about. And it led me into wonderful freedom. It was shortly after that the Lord asked my wife and I, I'm going to share some things, not for resume building, please, but unto the purpose of um, in here in a moment, asking you to respond to the Lord in a particular way. I remember the Lord spoke to my wife and I and asked us to do a year-long Daniel fast several years ago. This hurt my feelings. <laughs> I like working out. I've been in fitness for over 20 years. I used to be a CrossFit athlete and all of this types of stuff. It hurt my feelings because I knew that I would give myself to certain processes and I wouldn't be able to get the results from it. Man, no meat, no protein, like... Like, no protein bars, no protein shakes. Like, Lord, no, this can't be you. And some of us are actually convinced that God doesn't even have any interest in the things that we eat. All right, Matthew 3 says that John the Baptist came in camel hair, leather belt, eating locusts and honey. That God actually spoke to John about his diet. <laughs> and I believe that he is actually willing to speak to some of us about ours if he would allow us. He spoke to John about his wardrobe. <laughs> you might think I'm just trying to exaggerate the scriptures. That's actually not what I'm doing. John wore camel hair and a leather belt. He spoke to him about his wardrobe. As he's spoken uniquely to people over the history of the scriptures, he told Abraham, we're going to use you in a powerful way. Actually, your life is going to touch the nations of the earth. But Abram in Genesis 18, 18 and 19, how are we going to do that? Actually, we're going to send you home first. And we're going to deal with the way that you lead your house. And how you live life from the hub of your house. Because as I've heard it said best, if a man can touch his home, he can touch the world. Gideon in Judges 6, we're going to use you. It's going to happen. You're going to be powerful in public. But you can't be pitiful in private. We have to reconcile the two. And so Gideon, go home and deal with generational things in your house. And tear down Asherah poles and idols and altars. Because I do want to use you in public, but I'm not going to let it bypass what's happening in private. Samuel grows up sensitivity to the Lord and the first difficult word that Samuel gets is actually the first word right and after that he's recognized regionally as a prophet whose words never fall to the ground but his words never fall to the ground because he obeyed what God wanted with the first word that he ever got <laughs> do we really want to say what he's saying or do we only want Jeremiah 23 to say what we know people are going to applaud to use our gift and to leverage it towards the desires of crowds, where God says in Jeremiah 23, you spoke and you used your gift, but it wasn't inspired. He said, I didn't speak to you. You prophesied, but I never spoke to you. You simply told them what they wanted to hear. You discern the hearts and the minds of men, and out of that fear of man and a subjectivity to the desires that they had more than desires that I had, you weren't willing to pay the price to consider the cost and actually pay it. You just gave them what they wanted. Right? But I believe that the Lord is revealing a company of people in these days by the invitation that he is issuing into the hearts of those that actually love his son. He's issuing an invitation to give him the right to define our devotion. Where we're just not any longer concerned about doing our own thing. But I want to do the Jesus thing. And as I do the Jesus thing, I'm actually going to yield to his voice. And in whatever way God speaks to me, you can have my heart. And it may be that the Lord speaks to you, right? Because again, like I said, in Esther's case, sometimes you have to actually be on one so that you can learn how to live off of one. 
It's been wild how in times of fasting, God has unveiled his desires. And I've gotten wisdom, I've gotten instruction, I've gotten counsel. God has released and revealed his agenda and how my life was to be postured to continue going after his purposes. And in the continued effort and investment of fasting and praying, God has continued to seize me and to align me in a radical way with what it is that he wants. Because it's just too easy to get consumed with so many other things. And so this morning, I want to ask the Lord to sweep over the room, yes, but to sweep over our hearts and to provide us with a grace. Right? We need grace to provide us with a grace to where these words in Song of Songs 210 we would wake up from the slumber of our hour, where we would be awakened in a real authentic way to the person of Jesus and to his agenda, and where we would get out of the stands of a spectator sport and get in the game, where we would get on the field in the place of fasting and praying and hastening the day of God's coming to greater align my life with him in an intimate place of fellowship and then his agenda where I know that I know that I know that my life is being invested into the purposes of God in this hour of history. And I don't want anything else. As a matter of fact, there's nothing else to live for. I want to know God. I want to know what he's doing. And I want to give my life to it in the way that he has called me to invest in this hour of history. And I'm going to ask the Lord to give us grace to touch our hearts, to wake us up, and then to invite us. There's the come away. And not just come away and then unto anything you want. Come away with me. All right? Fasting is not about just turning from meals. It's about intentionally and intimately turning to Jesus. Because you can miss a whole bunch of meals and miss a whole bunch of Jesus too. All right? Like we're not in that crowd that's like, bro, I got to hit a 21 so I can lose 21. You know, like, like I'm a fast away from, you know what I'm saying? Like how I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, let's stand up together. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, Jesus, we're asking you for joy and oil. We want to be a people that are smeared afresh. Even as Samuel tipped the horn over the life of David and he anointed him with oil, we pray for a fresh anointing in this season of our life, a fresh anointing to say yes. Man, we know that there's a variety of gifts that there's all types of ways to flow and to go. People are moving in extraordinary ways in giftedness and power, levels and measure of anointing and the demonstration of the Spirit's abilities. But Lord, I'm asking you for a company of people that if there's a gift we desire, I'm asking you, Lord, to brand us with the gift of yes. And as we prayed in the beginning, have what you want. In my heart and in my life, get what you paid for. Your blood has purchased a people for God. We are a family of new creatures. We're no longer our own. We don't belong to our own agenda. The forming and the fulfilling of all of our own worldly desires. But we're a Jesus people. Holy Spirit, I pray, bridle us this morning. (laughs) 
bridle us this morning and say whatever you want to say. Right now, arise. Arise, arise, arise. Arise and be awakened, my beautiful one. I pray right now that those of us that have just been dulled, we've been calloused because of all of the things running rampant in our culture. I pray that we would stop looking at culture and that we would start looking at the radiant face of the King and that we would begin to behold in a greater way the face of this man with eyes like fire, hair white like wool, voice like a multitude of rushing waters. I pray, fix our gaze. Help us to linger long and to look deep. Once again, brand us with a fresh vision of the man Jesus. Lead us into more real places of encounter. And I'm asking you that you would cause people in this room to wake up to the whispers of the Spirit, to wake up to the desires of God in their life personally, leading them to surrender to the leadership of Jesus in a greater way. And Lord, would you tenderly touch our attention and our affections. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Give us a Daniel 1.8. He resolved in his heart not to defile himself with the delicacies of the king's table and the Babylonian culture. Give us a Daniel 3 resolve when Nebuchadnezzar erected his images and released his sounds. <laughs> Where demonic agenda was through the visuals and the audio. The things that people were looking at and watching and listening to. Sights and sounds. To be an oily, joy-filled company. Maybe we just can't watch everything we think we want to watch. Maybe we just can't listen to everything we think we want to listen to. Maybe that means I can't have Bethel and Beyonce on my playlist. Or whatever it is for you. Whatever it is for you. I don't even know Beyonce stuff. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. But Lord, even that one right now, that's like, I don't need to be delivered from Beyonce. And we're trying to excuse ourselves from the conversation. Lord, whatever our thing is, Maybe we just can't watch whatever we want to watch, listen to what we want to listen to, feed on what the culture is pushing across the table. Maybe you are going to speak to us about our wardrobe and our diet. Lord, I pray have your way. And may we be a people wholly given over to Jesus as King, his leadership in our lives, and a heart that is not compartmentalized. For the eyes of the Lord are searching throughout the earth for a heart that is fully his for a heart that belongs to him for a life that in a whole way is offered over to God on behalf of who he can show himself strong I'm gonna ask you lay your hand on the person next to you come on we're gonna take just another moment and if you pray in the spirit I want you to begin to pray in the spirit come on if you sing in the spirit stir it up Lord Whoa. Stir it up, Lord. Roma, mama, mama, yeah. Yeah, mama, mama. Set our affections free. Set our affections free. Oh! Set
set our attention free. Now, for just another moment, just softly, just pray in the Spirit. Come on, and if you haven't been filled with the evidence of a spirit language, just be baptized right now. Now let's just release your love song. Come on, release your love song. Come on, release your heart song to the Lord. Holy Spirit, crack the well of our affections. Crack the well of our affections. Come on, let it rise, let it rise, let it rise. Come on, let's sing it together. Come on, let's sing it together. Sing it from your heart. Come on, you deserve this, Jesus. You deserve this, King Jesus. You deserve it. You are entitled to it. Oh, worthy one. 